This is a podcast about all things holistic health and self-discovery with me, Ask Elizabeth, counsellor, health advocate and fundraiser. Join me as we get to know these guests and learn about how they implement health, well-being and self-care practices into their lives. Welcome to Unearthing Wellbeing with Ask Elizabeth, where our greatest wealth is health. Hi everyone and welcome back. This next guest is leading mindset coach, journaling expert, speaker and earth warrior Alyssa Bodiglieri. I can't wait for you all to listen and get inspired. We spoke about the subconscious mind, journaling, unblocking potential and operating at our best. In this episode I took a more laid back approach and listened attentively more than I spoke. I think anyway. You will soon find out why, so I will stop myself there and let you listen for yourself. Hi, Alyssa. Thank you so much for coming on to Unearthing Wellbeing. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. So tell us a little bit about yourself for those who don't know you or who know you but would like to know more yeah perfect so my name is Elisa and I'm from Sydney Australia and to cut a long story short basically um what what I do I guess you could say my my work in this world the the you know the the purpose that I feel I was really given and, and tapped into was to really I mean, the work that I do is, is working with people around their mindset and, and in particular their subconscious mind and helping them to really identify those core subconscious programming. But when you when you look at it on a, a bigger scale, what I really help people do and women in particular is just unlock their, their potential, you know, clear whatever is in the way for them to come back home to their natural state. Because one thing I always say is, you know, abundance is our birthright. It is our natural state. So if we are living in a state of struggle or suffering constantly, that's not our natural state. And I guess this is where my own journey started nine years ago. I was constantly living in a state of struggle and suffering. And I was so unhappy. I was blaming the world and everything around me for what I didn't have in my life for what I did have in my life never knowing how to take responsibility for my own reality. And it led me down a path of struggle. You know, it really did lead me down a path of struggle. Growing up, I went through my own journey at school, in primary school, bullying. I was a dancer ever since I was three. And I was always the, you know, the the chubby kid at school, you know, kids that carry that baby fat And then we think that we're fat and then we grow up and we're like, that was just puppy fat that I was carrying. You know, we, we lose it. But at the time it's like, it's, it's the worst thing in the world, especially if you're being bullied because of it. Right. Mm. So going through childhood and primary school and dancing, which if anyone's been in the dancing industry, it is very competitive. It, It can be very catty at the best of times. So there was, you know, not enoughness around dancing and, and how I looked and, I eventually got to high school and I started running with my dad and I lost all the weight and I created all this confidence within because, you know, I'd I'd lost the weight that I felt quite embarrassed about for for so many years of my life. And then it led me down a road of really having a passion for health and fitness and I became a personal trainer. Then when I was around 22, I think I was, I, I even competed in fitness modeling competitions And I always say this was like the catalyst of change for me because in my first competition I placed, which was great. And then I decided to compete again a few weeks later. When I was sitting down with my trainer at the time, I I had this epiphany and I always say whenever I'm asked this question, you know, about my past, this was the first time I actually truly understood what it meant to listen to your intuition and to be guided and to know and understand that there is a higher power guiding us and and 
supporting us and co-creating with us because it was the first real, I guess, intuitive message I received that I listened to. And when I was sitting with my trainer to compete for the second time, I just had this feeling come over me where I was like, "This, what are you doing this for, Elisa? What are you trying to prove? You're, you're miserable. You're unhappy. You're doing this for all the wrong reasons. And this was all the, the, the intuitive guidance that I was receiving that I never knew was there. It's always there, but we need to know how to tap into that, right? Yeah. And I looked at my trainer and I just said, I can't do this again. I'm not doing it for the right reasons. I need to, I need to sort my, I don't want to swear. I don't know if we can swear on the podcast, but I was like, I basically need to sort myself out. You know, yeah. like I'm not, I'm not happy. This, this, I'm not in a good place. And so I scrapped competing, dropped it all. And I just really started working on myself and I hired my very first coach who is still a dear friend to this day. I will always be so grateful for her because she really was the first person that kicked me off on my healing journey. And that was, I haven't looked back from there. You know, I started diving into the the mind and I really healed my own life through mindset work alone. And I know this is really, it's, it's a bit of a controversial subject and topic to talk about, but you know, I truly believe that majority of people that are struggling in some way can really transform their life through through the inner work, the internal work. I believe 100%. that. You know? And a lot of people, you know, we're told, you know, we go to the doctors and we say we're struggling mentally. The first thing they do is put you on medication, mm-hmm. right? Because they're not taught to to teach people how to actually work on their selves and look at what's going on for them internally and where why are they feeling the way they're feeling and don't get me wrong you know medication absolutely has its place in this world and I do believe there are people out there that get to a point where they need that support they need that help but for the majority of people I truly believe that we can heal our life and transform our life by doing the work, the internal work, because I've done that for myself. That's how I shifted my entire life was through doing this work and really going deep into the subconscious mind. And and I became obsessed with it. I became obsessed with understanding how the mind works, in particular the subconscious mind, because when you can get to that, you can shift anything in your life. And so now that is what I help, you know, really powerful women. Now I'm talking women that are you know, they know what they want in life or they, they're already running a business or they're already creating success or impacting the world. But they come to me and they all say the same thing. They're always like, Elisa, I know what I want to do. I'm here on purpose, but there's just something in the way and I can't see what it is. And my response is always, you can't see what it is. You're exactly right because it's in your subconscious. And unless we know how to ask the right questions to get there, it's forever going to be there. It's it, they're forever going to be a programming that is going to get in the way of what we truly desire. So that is the core of the work that I do, and yeah, a bit of my backstory. That's amazing, and I think that it's so true um, with regards to the unconscious mind. I've got a background in psychology and counselling, and yeah, like we learnt about this all throughout university, and um, it's so. I feel like it's a not course, but it's the type of education that we all need to learn about. Mm-hmm. So it's like in our toolkit for the rest of our lives, um, and it's amazing that you're able to help so many people um, tap into that and become their best and happier selves Mm, yeah absolutely it's so powerful once we know how to to get there and to do the work Mm, yeah a hundred percent and tell us a little bit more about like the subconscious mind and how you I guess define that and what you do about it (laughs) <laughs> wow there are so oh gosh I could talk about this literally for hours and there are so <laughs> many layers to our subconscious minds like literally there are so many layers we as human beings have only tapped into around I think it's around seven percent of our of our mind of what our mind can actually do we've only tapped into seven percent it's nothing it's huge yeah. right it, it's it's huge in terms of how much we haven't tapped into yet. So can you imagine 
if we start to learn how to utilize our mind and more of it, we would literally be superhumans. Like it's just, (laughs) yes, like it literally blows my mind how much we haven't tapped into. But in terms of the subconscious mind, the way I like to describe it is obviously you've got your conscious mind, which is to put it simply that the beliefs, the behaviors, the patterns that you are aware of, right? They're in your conscious mind. Then you've got your subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is your emotional mind, right? And our subconscious mind is basically developed from the ages of zero, pretty much zero to 12, but from the ages of zero to three, zero to three to four, we are literally walking subconscious minds, meaning our conscious mind hasn't even been developed yet. Our conscious mind doesn't actually start developing from the age of around, I think it's around 10 up until we're 20. So we are literally, yeah, so we are literally walking subconscious minds when we are three, zero to three years old. Everything we feel, everything we hear, everything we experience, everything we hear from our parents, everything we hear from people around us, it is a subconscious programming that we are developing. It is, it is being stored in that subconscious memory. And our subconscious mind, because it's our emotional mind, it stores in particular the events that we go through that didn't feel good, the, the challenges that we go through, the difficulties that we go through, And then we grow up with this blueprint. I call it our internal blueprint. It's like it's our blueprint for how we do everything in life and everyone's blueprint looks different. And because we are with our parents majority of the time in those, in those, um, I guess you could call them the developing, those developing critical years, Mm -hmm. we learn whether our parents do it intentionally or unintentionally, we learn everything from them that's where it's stored that's that's where we create our beliefs but then we also have if you want to break the subconscious mind up we also have um there's different ways in which our subconscious mind can be imprinted meaning we've got ancestral right ancestral lineage ancestral beliefs that we carry meaning our subconscious mind carries beliefs and experiences that we haven't even experienced ourselves, but our ancestors have. And it gets passed, it gets passed on through cellular memory. It gets passed on through DNA. It gets passed through um basically it's the cellular memory that, that's happening. It gets passed on to through generations. And they actually say that our ancestors that passed on, if they passed on with beliefs and trauma that they have not yet healed when they were still here in their human form, then they pass on those beliefs to the generations after them to heal, which is why sometimes we can be carrying a belief. We don't understand why we have it. We can, you know, have you ever had a belief where you're sort of like, I know this belief doesn't serve me, but I have no idea why I feel this way. Why do I believe this? And a lot of the time, it's because it's a belief you're carrying that's not even yours. It's an experience that you haven't even gone through yourself, but your ancestors have. So you've got the ancestral imprint. Then you've got your family tree imprints, right? Which is when you look at your family tree, you've obviously got your mom, dad, siblings, grandparents, aunties, uncles, cousins. When you look at your tree, a lot of the time we can we can figure out what our um, subconscious beliefs are by looking at the patterns throughout our family tree, right? So you may have a great, great, great auntie who had an abusive relationship and then your auntie after that also had the same experience. Then your auntie after that had the same experience. Then your grandma had the same experience. Then your mum had the same experience. And you may find you're in a situation where you're experiencing the same thing. Or maybe in your family tree, there's a consistent history of, um, you know, businesses not doing well or financial struggle, 
So you've got your family tree imprints, the patterns that are that are similar and familiar. Mm. And you've obviously got societal imprints, right, which is what you hear, what we see from society and how that can imprint our belief system and dictate what we believe. Um, and then you've also got your own imprints. So what are the experiences that you went through as a child that have left you with certain beliefs and programming that, that don't serve you? And this is all subconscious. This is all stuff that gets stored in the subconscious mind. Amazing. And I can't remember exactly where I heard it, but it was so powerful. And I heard on a, on a podcast one day, I think it was a podcast or actually, no, it was a book I was listening to and I can't remember exactly what it was, but the person reading the book basically said, your conscious mind is your will and your subconscious mind is your power. And when they are in harmony, you have willpower, uh-huh. right? Which is why it's so important for them to be in harmony. Because the subconscious mind dictates 95% of what we do, what we think, how we show up, our habits, our beliefs. 95% of that on a daily basis is coming from a subconscious place. That's insane. So this is why so many people are struggling or not creating what they can create because they're operating from a place that is 95% subconscious. They're not even aware of why they do what they do. So this yeah. is why it's so important to, to know how to get to that subconscious mind and start rewiring it. Mm. And like tapping into what serves you and what doesn't and trying to alter that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Getting to the source of the problem. Yeah. Do you, do you think that uh, when you were talking about how kids um, operate on, well, one sorry zero to three year olds operate on a subconscious Mm -hmm. level all the time do you think that's why um they don't remember a lot of it or any of it really yeah yeah potentially potentially because because we are only operating from a subconscious place in those formative years and it's and, and like I said before, the subconscious mind is the emotional mind. So it, it only gets triggered and created through emotions, right? Our conscious mind doesn't doesn't work off emotion. So emotions are obviously the things that that trigger different um, feelings within us, and those feelings dictate how we do things. So as kids, yes, we can forget our experiences because it is in the subconscious mind and this is why as you get older and you start to if you if you do this work and you start to realize the subconscious mind is controlling a lot it's why we it's important to know the right questions to ask so that we can trigger those memories again Mm. yeah and like as you were saying that I'm just thinking when people see red right Mm -hmm. like you're in those states where you actually do stuff but you can't actually remember what you've done yeah so because you're working on your you're working on a subconscious uh, subconscious level Mm. you have to actually kind of step back after those experiences and kind of think about what have I done um like whether it be bad or good Yes. And why did I do those things? Yeah. Yeah. Because they're kind of out of your control sometimes. Yeah. Well, that's why, you know, it's something I've said for such a long time now is self-awareness is our greatest human superpower. It really is. The more self-awareness we can cultivate, the more we will have an understanding around why we do the things that we do. And like you just said then, we then have the ability to step back Mm. and to look from a bird's eye perspective and be able to go with an um, inquisitive mind, you know, to to have, to have like this one thing, one, and it's almost like a skill, a habit, maybe you want to call it or a muscle that you want to get really good at. Like, you know, you go to the gym, you, you, you know, you, do squats you get stronger legs and a stronger butt right so it's like 
this inquisitive mind and this self-inquiry, it's like the same thing. It's a muscle that we need to learn how to get stronger around over and over and over again. So when we are in situations where we can see that we aren't showing up as our higher self or we are showing up from a, a wounded or, or triggered place, it's having that muscle so strong that in that moment we can step back and have the ability to so have self-inquiry and, and go, that's interesting that I showed up that way. <laughs> why did I do that? Why, do, why am I feeling that way? Um, you know, what was it that actually really triggered me in that moment? Mm. But the reason why people struggle to do that as well, well, there's two reasons. A lot of the time they don't know how to even ask those questions and what questions to ask to figure that out but then there's also if I ask myself these questions I also have to take responsibility for what I've just done yeah which is the hardest part and that is one of the hardest things that I have had to learn to do but it has been the, one of the most freeing things I've allowed myself to do is I'm at a point now where I don't get me wrong. I don't. I don't think it ever gets fun taking responsibility for you know the, the ways in which we show up that aren't our higher self. Mm. But I can tell you now, it is so liberating and it feels so freeing and powerful when we can just own it. Yeah. And we can take full responsibility and go. Do you know what? I stuffed up there. I did not show up as my higher self there, and just own it. Because once you own it. It no longer owns you and no one else can hold it over you either exactly. anymore. And Elise, once you're at that point, you recognise whether like you're wrong or right. And if you are wrong, sometimes it means that you need to apologise for your actions. And yeah. once you've done that, you're actually not holding that guilt, anxiety or anything else that gets yes. bottled up in here. Yes. Exactly. And that's a whole nother conversation, like holding on to, because everything is energy, Yeah. right? Everything is energy. So whatever emotion we are holding on to that is toxic or not serving us literally gets stored within us energetically. And this is one of the things I work on with clients a lot as well, where if we're working on certain beliefs, I'll ask them, where, are they, where do you actually feel that in your body? Because these emotions are energy that need to be moved in some way. And so whenever we can shine a spotlight on certain beliefs that we have, it instantly shifts it energetically in the body. It moves it, mm. right? It's like the way I describe that visually is like pretend you're in this really dark garage and you've got a torch and like you're going like this and you shine a light and all of a sudden it's like flaring on a on a mouse or something, right? What is that mouse going to do? It's going to scram, yeah, right? Because you'll be like, oh, my God, like it's so bright and it's going to scram. Our beliefs within our body, if we're talking from an energetic perspective now, are exactly the same thing. They sit there in the body and they just sit there and they need to be moved. Once you can ask the right questions to uncover what those beliefs are our beliefs do the same thing it's like a torch is shone on it and it's like oh my god you can see me and it has the chance then to move from the body which is why so often when I work with people in releasing the beliefs they'll say to me I instantly feel lighter or I instantly feel less anxiety or I instantly feel less tense and I'm like because you have physically just moved that belief just yeah. by shining the spotlight on it, you've moved it. Mm. I think a lot of people in their lifetimes, if they're honest with themselves, they're able to do that. But I think from the experiences that I've had in my own life where, um, well, recently loved ones have passed away, what mm. I've noticed in their last few days, they kind of face all of those things that they've been holding for so long mm -hmm. and then they end up apologizing for it and like taking responsibility but once it's yeah. done you can see there's a shift in their bodies and they're able to kind of be at peace so once yeah. they are like going to pass away yeah you you see it like 
they breathe out and it's just peaceful and they can mm-hmm. rest easy kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's so beautiful. And I yeah, I can totally imagine that. And you know, I have heard that yeah, people that are, you know, about to pass away, it's like they they do have these feelings of like I just need to let this go so I can pass peacefully because I don't want to carry this with me anymore, you know. So and yeah. it's also like pass, not passing the baton as such, but it's also um, allowing that other person or persons to kind of deal with what was going on for them that they'd been holding for so long as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, well, it allows that other person to heal as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I just thought of that. It was a bit random, but, yeah, I totally yeah. understand. Um, and, like, for those clients that you've got, you're able to help them strengthen their mindset. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit more about how you do that and what ways you found are quite effective. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So basically the the process that I would take a client through when I'm helping them to to do that is very very simple. We we get to the subconscious mind, ask them the questions, we dig up the source of why they do what they do, why they feel the way they feel, um, where their internal programming has come from. Then we look at reframing that, right? And, and shifting that. And then the third step is embodying. So actually participating in the new belief, in the new programming that you're choosing now to um, to embody and, and to carry because we cannot permanently shift a belief until we are embodying the embodiment of that belief, which is why a lot of people will say to me, you know, Elise, I'm really struggling to embody this new belief or to believe this to be true or, you know, I want to believe this new positive programming but I'm struggling to do that. And my first question will be, well, are you actually embodying that belief? Mm. Are you actually participating in that new belief? Meaning are you showing up now as someone who believes that? And so that's like kind of like a three-step process that I go through. But the number one tool that I teach all of my clients is journaling because uh, uh, journaling has been like the most powerful tool I've ever used along my journey. And the first thing so many people say to me when I mention journaling is I hate it. I hate it. It feels like a chore. It feels monotonous. It doesn't work. I feel like I'm just writing for the sake of writing. And it makes me laugh so much because it's exactly how I felt around three, four years ago now to the point that I remember so vividly I was sitting on my bed journaling one morning because I had heard that journaling is good for you. I was always hearing and reading journaling is so powerful. You know, it's a really good tool. It can help you shift things. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to give this journaling a go. And I felt exactly the same. I felt like it was monotonous. I felt like I was just going through the motions. It wasn't shifting anything for me. It wasn't changing anything for me. To the point I remember sitting on my bed and I was ready to give up on it. I was like, you know what? That's great. It might work for some people, but I'm just not. It doesn't work for me. I got so frustrated with it. But something inside of me was saying, Elisa, just stick with it just stick with it. So I did. I stuck with it and all of a sudden it just clicked, meaning I didn't learn it from anyone in particular. It just clicked within me how journaling actually needs to be done so that it is effective. Mm. And journaling is so much more than just getting out pen and paper and a pretty journal and writing cute affirmations, right? It's so much more than that. It can be used as one of the most powerful tools when it comes to healing and releasing beliefs, calling in and manifesting what you want to call in in your life. But there are so many layers to it. There's the language. So I call it the art of journaling, which is actually the, the program that I created around it. It's called the art of journaling because there is an art to it. 
And it comes down to the language, how to actually write in your journal effectively so that you are effectively clearing what you need to clear or calling in what you need to call. There's the psychology behind it. There is learning how to journal so that you're tapping into guidance. So those days where you're like, God, I wish I could just receive some clarity around this question or I feel really stuck around this. And knowing how to journal so that you can receive that clarity, right, once you've tapped into your higher power, whether that, I mean, for me it's the universe, for some people it's God, for other people it's higher self, their angels, their guides. I don't. I would say I don't care who it is. Just connect to something. Yeah. <laughs> just make sure that you are connected to something because you are in a co-creation here. We all are. And when we can find out what our higher power is, we then understand we are hitting something in particular. I don't know how to write it in my journal and receive that, receive the belief that's not serving me. Mm. So that's the that's the the number one tool that I teach my clients and basically it's just a journey of uncovering a belief reframing that and getting them to embody the new so that eventually they've created a new identity and when I say they've created a new identity they don't change who they are if anything they just remember who they are yeah and they come back to that I I refer to that as a happiest, healthiest self. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, like, I was going to ask you what techniques you normally use, but you already mm-hmm. answered that question. Yep. Beat me to the bullet. <laughs> Excuse yep. me. Um, but, yeah, I think a lot of people struggle to start, and this is what I've seen in my own practice, because they don't want to face their truths. Mm-hmm. Yeah. so funny you said that I, yeah I just had a session with a client where we were talking about this exactly yeah and yeah I, I guess like what I mean by that is that it's kind of like they know what's happening inside of them and subconsciously and all that um but they don't want to face it yet and I guess mm-hmm. that's completely fine right like mm-hmm. everyone's on a journey and until they're ready for it, they're not going to go on. It, they're not going to be um, present, mm-hmm. right? Um, so I think once that work is actually done, though, you're able to be more honest with yourself as well. Definitely. And, yeah. And I think it's really powerful anyway. So don't knock it before you try it. <laughs> like I said in my <laughs> blog post about how important journaling and mm. how um, amazing it can be, mm. powerful. So, so powerful. Yeah. Aside from like journaling, what other techniques do you use with your clients? Yep. So, as I was saying before, a lot of energy work as well. So, um, really getting them to feel into their body and where energetically, physically are they feeling these beliefs and getting them to start moving that, whether it's through awareness, whether it is through breath work, whether it's through meditation, whether it is through dancing, going for a walk, whatever it is, it's the energetic aspect of it as well and really understanding that you've got the mind but then you've also got the the energetic side of it as well and you need to be able to really work with both so that you can then clear what needs to be cleared on a mental level and on an energetic level. So there's a lot of that that I work with as well around clients. Um, and, yeah, it's it's really just it sounds so simple but it really is. Like there really isn't anything too complicated or um, expansive around what I do in terms of how I work with my clients it sounds simple and it really is and that's because when you know a lot of the work that I do is just asking the right questions the right powerful questions because truly that is really all it takes to get to someone's um, programming and help them really shift it right so 
yeah, when, when people ask me, you know, what are all the techniques and all the things that you do, it's very simple. It's very simple. And it's more around the questions that I ask. And anyone that's worked with me will tell you that, that the questions that I ask are like, how did you just do that? Like, how did you just get to my subconscious then? How did we just uncover that? It really is all in asking the right questions. So that's the main the main tool that I use and teach my clients so that they can then teach themselves to do the same. Yeah. Do you find that um, with the more clients that you see, you kind of know what they're going to be coming in with and you know what questions you're going to be asking to kind of tap into their subconscious? Yes and no. So, yeah, I guess it's funny you say that because no one's actually ever asked me this before and I've never really thought about it. But thinking about it now, yeah, I think I probably, because I've been doing this for so long, when I'm sort of talking to clients before I start working with them, I do, I can tend to sort of figure out what it is we're going to have to work on because it really is my my job a lot of the time as well is learning how to read between the lines of what they're saying, right? Yeah. So, yeah, there is an aspect of me sort of knowing what we're going to have to focus on with a client, but the way that I work is very intuitive as well. It's not structured. So it's not like I have a session with a client and then we go through a structured session and, okay, now we're going to do this and now we're going to do that because that's not how the subconscious mind works. And if we're working with the subconscious mind, we cannot be logical or structured. So it's really about intuitively on my end, reading between the lines, knowing what questions I have to ask so that the subconscious mind can start to open up. And then from there, yes, I do probably have like a handful of questions that I know to ask. And when I need to ask those questions to to dig up more. But, yeah, apart from that, it's really just more I allow the client to see a lot of the time as well, my clients will come in thinking that they've got to work on something. But what we end up uncovering is totally unrelated. Yeah. Yeah. I find that too with my clients and that's why I asked you that question because yeah. a lot of people assume that like with counselling, um, you just utilize the same techniques mm-hmm. and modalities every single time. And it's like, no, you need to go in with the knowledge that everyone is unique. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there might be some similarities in terms of who you're seeing, but everyone goes through a journey that's completely different and special. And yeah, how you go about um how you go about things with one client may be completely different to another. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so thanks sure. for, <laughs> I guess, enlighten me, yeah. enlightening me about that too. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, so with you personally, so we were talking about how you work um, with your clients, but for yourself, how do you manage, because I'm sure that your caseload is quite, full on how do you manage all of that and avoid burnout Mm. I'm always about being totally honest and this is not something that I have fully mastered myself I am a lot better at it but just like anyone like I am a human being right Mm. and right now at this stage in my life I've got more going on than I have for a very long time because I'm getting married in eight weeks so there's that yeah super exciting super exciting but there's there's that and then there's also running a business at the same time right so normally I would just have the load of running my business and obviously um, making sure that I'm a present partner um, making sure that I'm present with family I'm present with friends I'm present for myself as well you know first and foremost Mm. Um, but and I used to be I mean I have what you would call an a-type personality right so uh, my brain is just constantly on and I, it's a gift and it's a curse at the same time, right? And one thing I've learned and I'm still learning to do is to really set, you know, it's so funny, we're always talking about setting boundaries with other people, right? Mm-hmm. 
we never talk about setting boundaries with ourselves. Like that's really not something that's talked a lot about. And what I have learned to avoid burnout over the years and in recent times as well is that I need to have boundaries with myself as well. And I need to, there's so many layers to this, but really to avoid burnout, it's knowing what is a priority for you each day. Like what is a priority for you and being crystal clear on that every day. So each morning I will make sure that I spend five minutes, ten minutes getting crystal clear on what are the what are the what are the big things that I want to do that day, right? The things that I want to manifest that day, the things that I want to create or, or do that day. And to avoid the burnout, I make sure that I do them in the chunk of time where I know my mind and my body operates at its best. Yeah. So what I used to do for a very long time, especially when I started my coaching business nine years ago, I used to take clients at night and in the evening because I was like, oh, well, you know, people go to work and that's probably when they're only available and which, yeah, is true to an extent. And I guess being an established coach now, yeah, I probably do have more flexibility to pick and choose when I want to work. I, I'm not in a position where I, you know, I'm, I don't even want to use the word desperate, but I'm not starting, you know, when you're starting I'm a business, starting like, what yeah. you do, you're sort of like, yeah, I'll take whoever, whenever sort of yeah. thing, right? Because you, you want to. And I wish this is something that I, I had awareness around when I first started is really allowing myself to do the things that I need to do each day in the chunk of time where I know I operate best. For me, that is the morning and maybe just after lunch. Going into the evening, afternoon, no. I know I don't operate at my best. I don't do calls. I don't do clients. I don't do podcasts. I don't do anything. I allow myself to completely switch off in the afternoon. I don't even trainings that I might run, I do in the morning, right? Because I know that if I do things in the evening, I will burn out. Yeah. And it's also learning each day that we do not have to fill ourselves up with this massive list of things that we have to do. Because what I've found over the years with myself and with clients is that when we create these massive lists every day, we don't end, end, even end up getting through half of it. Exactly. Right? A lot of the time the things that we write down really don't need to be a priority on that day. And what I've noticed and what I've learned to do is to do less things each day but take bigger steps each day. Mm. So does that make sense? Yeah, so it's yeah, like the, the things that I set myself to do each day, yeah, they may be bigger steps that I'm taking, but I'm doing a lot less. And in operating that way, I'm going to go further a lot quicker. Yeah. You're working and smarter, a lot harder. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. what it is. Working smarter, not harder. Yeah. And, of course, there's there's the obvious things like making sure that I move my body in some way every day, even if it is just stretching for five minutes or doing something, making sure that I meditate if I'm feeling like my nervous system needs to be reset, um, making sure that I am always nourishing myself, you know, with, with the right foods. That's super important. Um, making sure that I am not afraid to have boundaries with other people as well and and set boundaries you know um i think it is so important to to feel safe to set boundaries with people in our lives and we can do it from a loving and powerful place because what i've learned over the years is that if i don't set boundaries and i show up especially with family and friends that i you know care about and love dearly from a place of obligation then, yeah, in that moment, they may be feeling like I'm showing up for them. But long term, I'm just going to carry resentment. And when we show up in those moments 
over time, they're going to start to feel that we're not fully there or we're not fully showing up as our best self because we're doing it from a place of obligation. So there'll be times where maybe I will, I'll cut conversations and say, look, I'm going to, I'm going to deal with this tomorrow or I'm going to, you know, whether it's with friends or with family or I'll get back to you tomorrow. I'm doing this and just being very assertive with your time with your energy is one of the best things, most powerful things we can do to avoid that burnout, you know? Um, And then the energetic side of it is really learning how to trust and surrender around what we want to call in. If we're in a constant state of trying to force and push and not trusting that our desires are going to show up, not letting the co-creation happen, then we're constantly going to be in a state of burnout because we we haven't learned to surrender and to trust and to allow the higher power to also play its part because it's not just on us. Mm, 100%. And like what you were saying about those checklists, I think, don't get me wrong, it's great to have ambitions and goals. And Mm. like for me personally, I write what I, or I keep in my head what I want to be achieving for Mm -hmm. like a long-term kind of thing so whether it be within a year's time or Mm -hmm. a month's time that's what I want to be achieving but if you set small goals for the day you're able to achieve much more than if you write like you said like if you write a whole list of things that you've got to do because you end up becoming overwhelmed and anxious and sure if you end up finishing that small list in the day and you've got that energy to do more then absolutely do one or two things from that next list that's completely fine but don't make yourself don't pull yourself in so many ways that you end up not having anything left for yourself at the end of that day exactly and you just made a really good point there as well which which yeah is something I say a lot is every day is going to look and feel different Mm. and we need to be able to be in tune with ourselves and to check in every day and to know where we are at how am I feeling today do I have the energy I need to have today to do these things that I've said I was going to do what does my soul need for me need from me today yeah because when we try and resist that that's also when we end up in burnout because we we aren't listening exactly so when we can tune in and give ourselves what we actually need each day we're also going to get a lot more done mm-hmm. and move move further a lot quicker as well definitely and it's it's important to know that to avoid burnout you need to have those self-care techniques Mm -hmm. and things that you do and love and that work for you up your sleep at all times because if you don't have those you are definitely going to hit that burnout stage and that's yep. so important to note for those listening. Absolutely. And this is something I struggled with for a long time is actually stopping myself when I could feel that my cortisol was high, my nervous system was, you know, running on maximum speed. I didn't used to know how to pay attention to that and to listen to when that was happening. Now I drop everything if I feel that way. I drop everything and I let myself reset whether it's, like I said, meditation, going for a swim in the ocean, going for a walk. It doesn't matter what it is, but it's recognising when that's happening. It is so important to step away when you're feeling that way. Yeah, exactly. And don't get me wrong, like for those listening, it doesn't have to be an entire day that you take out for yourself. Like Mm -hmm. you may have a family, uh, you have to go to work and all that. Five minutes can make an absolute difference to oneself. Yeah. Yeah. For people that are working in a full-time capacity or have family, go to the bathroom and take five deep belly breaths, like deep belly breaths, because when we really pay attention to how we're breathing, we're always breathing from up here always whereas we need to be breathing from our from our belly five deep belly breaths can make the world of difference to your nervous system it can reset it instantly and you like you said you can do that in two to five minutes yeah exactly oh my god thank you so much for coming on like I think a lot of people will take something from this and learn to 
improve themselves. Um, I think with the title of um, this podcast being Unearthing Wellbeing, what are your three tips to leave everyone um, with before we part? Mm. So what what is coming to mind for me right now, do the work, the inner work, absolutely. To, to unearth that well-being, do the inner work, work on yourself, get to that subconscious mind. The second thing is allow yourself to ask yourself every single day, what can I do to experience more joy? Because I don't feel like this is a question that many people ask themselves, right? And if each day we can just ask ourselves, how can, how can I feel more joy today? What can I do to experience more joy? Joy is going to activate so much well-being within us. No, we're not always going to be in a constant state of joy, but joy is such a high vibration. So chase that, tap into that. Do the things that are going to make you feel joyful. And then the third thing is be on purpose each day. It's not about finding your purpose. Be on purpose. So be of service to yourself, to other people. Find that thing that you were put here to do and you will literally unleash who you are. And you don't need to find it. You just need to tap into it. It's already there. We were all put here with that thing that we were meant to do. And we find that through being on purpose every day. Yeah. And I think if anyone needs to, like, choose one of those things, the third one is so important because so many people just go about their days plodding along, along and not mm-hmm. doing what makes them happy, whether that be in a relationship, in employment slash careers. Um, just try to do that one step at a time and I think those three tips are amazing. So thank you very much. You're so welcome. (laughs) Well, take care and um, have the best day. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Wow. I don't know about you, but Alyssa really blew it out of the park. Her passion and knowledge was mind-blowing. I really loved the quote she shared too. Your conscious mind has will and your subconscious the power. When they're both in harmony, you have willpower. She really is superb. For those who want to learn more and uncover your full potential, message her for assistance. She can be found on Facebook and Instagram at Alyssa Buttigleri. To ensure Ask Elizabeth and Unearthing Wellbeing continues to grow, please subscribe and rate the podcast. Feel free to also share and tag us on your socials. I hope you have a lovely day, be safe and be kind, take care.